All right, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, so welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Saurabh Prasad. I'm an associate professor in the electrical and computer engineering department at the University of Houston. Um, I'm co-chair of the IEEE GRSS uh, Image Analysis and Data Fusion Technical Committee. And uh, on behalf of that committee, it's, it's my great pleasure to welcome our invited speaker, Amanda Zeman from uh, the Los Alamos National Lab today. Um, her talk will be on uh, multi-sensor and anomalous change detection. Uh, so Amanda is an imaging scientist uh, in the Space Remote Sensing and Data Science Group at Los Alamos. She holds a bachelor's uh, in applied math, a master's in computational math, and a PhD in imaging science, all from RIT. Um, she's been with Los Alamos since 2015, and she supports the geospatial intelligence um, program with a focus on developing uh, signal detection algorithms for ground-based, airborne, and space-borne sensors. So without further ado, uh, Amanda, you can get started. Uh, just a few, just a uh, uh, note to the audience. So this is uh, run as a webinar. If you have, uh, we'd prefer for general questions, we could keep those at the end. But if there's a burning question that you'd like to ask, you can ask during the talk and uh, I can look at it and uh, we can, uh, and if if it's if it needs to if we need to interrupt Amanda during the talk, we can do that if it's an important burning question. Otherwise, I would prefer you do it at the end. Um, you could post your questions through the Q and A button in Zoom, and if you'd prefer to speak, you could let me know there. I could uh, unmute you uh, at that time. Okay. So with that, uh, Amanda, the floor is yours. Excellent, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. Uh, so as Sarab said, my name's Amanda Zeman and I'm a scientist in the Space Remote Sensing and Data Science Group at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, since the Oppenheimer movie came out, it's been a lot easier to explain where I work. So if you've seen the movie, that's Los Alamos. Um, and even if you haven't seen it, that is still Los Alamos. So that's where I'm working. Uh, I'm super excited to be invited to give this webinar. I'm gonna be talking about some results from a couple of consecutive research efforts. So one was internally funded by Los Alamos and the other was externally funded by the US government. And they were consecutive research efforts. So this work recently ended uh, and there are a lot of open questions and research directions that I think would be great for someone to pursue. So I'm hoping that some of you all have interest in pushing on this research further. Okay, so what will I be talking about for the better part of the next hour? Uh, first, a research area that we recently spent a few years on. Uh, the promising initial results that we got, additional directions we went in and some dead ends that we hit. Uh, and my goal by the end of this presentation is for folks to be interested in picking up this work. So things that might convince you, or there are great research project opportunities for a student or intern that, um, that would follow on from some of the, the work that we've done. Uh, some of the foundational code has been open sourced. That's something that is not easy for government laboratories to do. So that's a pretty exciting piece. Uh, we have multiple publications to build on. So there's documentation. And I think this is a cool idea, uh, you know, not to, um, uh, I know there's sort of that risk of like getting high on your own supply, right? If you get excited about your own idea, but I think this is really cool. And there are some really interesting research uh, directions that this could go in. Um, I want to make sure to acknowledge my project teammates at LANL, uh, James Thyler, who many of you know, Christopher Wren and Zig Hample Arias. Okay, so our motivation, uh, as our community well knows, the number of imaging satellites has been experiencing exponential growth over the last few decades. And this chart doesn't even capture everything. It only goes to 2015 uh, and it doesn't include CubeSats or SAR. But what we are seeing here is this huge advent of diversity in our sensors. So why am I showing you this? Uh, 
as we know, one of the common areas of satellite image analysis is change detection. And that is looking for changes between two images captured by the same sensor at different points in time. And for a long time, the same sensor, sensor assumption uh, was a reasonable one. You know, there's a reason that the Landsat continuity mission was designed the way that it was. But now that we have all of these increasingly diverse satellite imagers, wouldn't it be nice if uh, we could integrate them together to find changes? And then we wouldn't be restricted to the revisit rate of a single satellite, but could instantiate instead potentially fill in the temporal gaps with these other satellites. So we would have the ability to compute changes more rapidly because we would have more frequent images that we could make use of. And so when we think about that kind of framework, it's more of a change surveillance framework where we're able to make use of multiple satellite images from multiple imaging systems. And when you move into that framework, you can start to characterize the types of changes, uh, for example, fleeting versus persistent. Uh, a fleeting change would be something like a temporary encampment, and a persistent change would be something like new construction. Uh, I do want to say there are trade-offs uh, when it comes to comparing images from different sensors and potentially different modalities, and we'll talk about those. I still think the ideal case is being able to do same sensor change detection that allows you to do a high fidelity signal analysis that you, you can't do with disparate sensors when the measurements are, are fundamentally uh, measuring different things. But in the absence of the ideal case, uh, you can still get useful information from these disparate sensors so they can help fill in that temporal gap. So our goal is to do this while operating uh, with the images directly in, in their original signal space. So we want to develop algorithmic capability for change detection that can find changes between images from different sensors without resampling the data in the signal domain. So we're not doing any data transformation to a common domain. Uh, so for example, if I have a multispectral image and a SAR image, how do I find changes between them? And, and how do I scale that kind of change analysis? There are a couple of different imaging modalities that we make use of in the results that I'll present today. So many of you are well familiar with them, so we'll cover these quickly. Just want to get us all on the same page. Uh, the first is spectral imagery, and although the results we're showing here are on multispectral imagery, these techniques do naturally extend to hyperspectral imagery. And I think Emmett Iantolucci is on here, so thanks, Emmett, for this figure. I've gotten a lot of use out of it over the last decade or so. Uh, and then the other modality that we're looking at is synthetic aperture radar, or SAR, uh, which as we know, it differs from spectral imagery and that it's more representative of surface structure um, due to the, the backscattering that it characterizes. And as our community knows well, there are a number of different ways to analyze these sources of data, and there are just innumerable applications for that analysis. And so these include environmental monitoring, disaster response, crop health, uh, detecting materials of interest to national security, identifying unsanctioned construction. There are a lot of national security applications, which is why um, Los Alamos is interested in this kind of analysis. So next, we'll briefly cover the basics of change detection and talk about the, the approach that we have implemented at Los Alamos. So traditional approaches to change detection are based on subtraction. There is an optional statistical alignment step, which can also be called radiometric alignment or radiometric equalization. And that's where the first and second order statistics between the images are equalized. Then the images are subtracted, resulting in a difference image. And the difference image is collapsed down and used to generate a detection map, 
where the score at each pixel indicates how likely it is for that pixel to correspond to a change. So a higher score means it's more likely to correspond to a changed region of the scene. And this intuitively makes sense, right? If I've got a pixel at time A and a pixel at time B and that pixel changes a lot, when I subtract it, I'm gonna have some magnitude to that difference vector. Now there's a huge body of work out there that addresses challenges and nuances in same sensor change detection. So this is not a solved problem, but this subtraction based approach is generally a reasonable approach for images captured by the same sensor. Um, that said, as soon as you move to multi-sensor imagery, this becomes much less straightforward. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, if your images come from different sensors, the bands are not going to line up. When the bands don't line up and we're subtracting them, whoa, the operation that we're making is physically meaningless. And then there's the potential for your two images to have different numbers of bands. And in that case, this kind of operation becomes mathematically impossible. So rather than traditional change detection, uh, which can include large scale changes as well, we're focusing on an aspect of change detection called anomalous change detection, where we're emphasizing changes that are different from how everything else might have changed. Uh, in this case, anomalous or rare is roughly equivalent uh, to interesting or potentially important. So we were trying to look for those, um, those infrequent, those small scale changes. So our approach was originally developed by one of our team members, James Thyler, for same sensor imagery, and it's based on joint distributions rather than subtraction. So the actual math behind this is pretty simple. It's also extremely flexible. And because we're comparing the overall trends in the two images, the inputs do not need to align in the signal domain. Uh, so that means we can compare a five channel image to a 12 channel image without doing any resampling uh, in, in that signal. So this makes it really naturally extensible to the multi-sensor regime. So I'm not going to get um, too far into the implementation details here. They're, they're covered in our publications, but I wanna give you a flavor of the intuition behind it. Um, so for a given X, Y pair of pixels where X is from the first image and Y is from the second image, and those are the pixels that line up uh, spatially, the change detection metric can be interpreted as a ratio of probabilities. Um, and by considering this ratio of probabilities, we're able to emphasize the pairs that have, um, that have different ratios than what is typical in the scene. So to make that a little bit more concrete, one example is if at time one, you have a grassy scene, and at time two, you have that same scene covered in snow. So your pixel pairs will be from time one and time two. Um, and in that case, a grass pair, a pixel paired with a snow pixel uh, would be common. And so that's a change that would um, not be considered anomalous when we look at these overall joint distributions. However, if a building has gone up in that time uh, and then you've got a pair of pixels that is grass to building, then that will be anomalous with respect to all of the other pairs. And those are the pairs that we can separate out with these joint distribution uh, models and the, the associated decision services without needing to do any resampling of the original pixel signal. So that's the key thing here um, that, I, that I want uh, you to have intuition for. And as I said, the implementation details are available in our publications. So there are practical considerations when you're doing multi-sensor anomalous change detection. Uh, these are things that you don't have to contend with as much when you're doing same sensor change detection. So uh, those include changes in spatial resolution. If you have two images from two different sensors, there's likely gonna be a difference in spatial resolution and so you have to contend with that. Uh, Sensitivity to clouds, especially when we're talking about spectral to SAR, we've got one modality that is highly sensitive to clouds and one that is not. Um, data access is an issue. So when you start considering 
images that come from different sensors, they likely come from different providers. And so they each have their own wonderful stovepipes uh, for accessing them. That can be a challenge if you want to make use of all imagery or a lot of imagery covering a or particular geospatial footprint. Uh, coverage is something to think about. So swath width might vary between the, um, the collection systems. You can't do this, this straightforward approach of radiometrically normalizing and subtracting. Uh, so it is a bit more complicated in that way. There might be changes that only appear in one modality. Um, I'll show an example of that later on. And so you can think about how spectral imagery is more sensitive to material changes and SAR imagery is more sensitive to surface kind of texture changes. And then there's the potential for more sensitivity to sensor artifacts, right? You're using multiple sensors, which means they don't, they each bring their own issue to the analysis. And as a result, you could be compounding the sensor artifacts. Um, so again, we're, we're not saying that this is better than same sensor change detection. It's, it's certainly not the solution to all change detection problems, um, but it can help fill in that temporal gap. Um, so it, there is, it, it brings value to the table, but it's, um, it, it requires some, I think, um, thoughtfulness when, when you're implementing it. Okay, so next, and the bulk of the time left, we'll walk through some of the experiments that we performed and their results. So for the initial experiments I'll be showing here, uh, we had three sources of imagery. So we used Sentinel-1, SAR, Sentinel-2, multispectral imagery, and Landsat-8, multispectral imagery. So as we're showing here, they have a mix of modalities and resolutions. Uh, we also considered two primary experimental frameworks, uh, multispectral versus SAR, and multispectral versus multispectral, but from different sensors. And then the, there's a third set of experiments that fo focuses on feature augmentation. Um, so I'll talk about that last. So for the three satellites listed here, we obtained streamlined access to imagery at scale through Descartes Labs. So that was a huge help for us. Um, and importantly, with our sensors identified that we wanted to test against, we needed an easy way to test the frameworks out. And we had to identify a large scale progressive change that could be easily seen from space. Uh, so for that, we focused on the construction of the LA Rams Stadium in Inglewood, California. It's now up and running. They've had Super Bowls here. Uh, but when we started this work, it was still under construction. And so it made for a really good test case for us. Okay, so we will start with the SAR to MSI experiment. So here we wanted to focus on a large change. So we had our image pairs span the full duration of our test set. In this case, it was December 2015 before the construction started uh, to March 2019 when that construction was ongoing. That's when we first started pulling this imagery. So on the left, we've got the uh, Sentinel-1 VH and VV channels. And on the right, we have an RGB composite for Sentinel-2. Uh, but just as a reminder, our, um, our Sentinel-2 MSI has 12 channels. So we're comparing a two-channel image to a 12-channel image. And we will be doing this change detection without resampling their measured signals. Okay, so here are the results. Um, and our feeling was not bad. Um, we were pleasantly surprised at these results. We expected to see noisy garbage. Um, and we thought it was pretty cool. You can see some of the, the road systems in the detection map, um, quite a bit of structure over the construction area, which is highlighted in green. And the key to interpreting the scale on the detection map is that the black pixels correspond to the anomalous changes. Uh, gray pixels correspond to common changes, like just the normal background changes. Um, and white pixels correspond to persistent anomalies. So those would be outlier kind of buildings that are present in both images. And so you can see some of the, um, the white rooftop structures corresponding to, um, to those types of buildings. Okay, so although the detection map looks reasonable, we needed a way to baseline those results that was a 
you know, in some way quantitative. So to do that, we computed an ideal change detection map for the same time frame um, using only Sentinel-2 MSI images. So in the previous one, we compared Sentinel-1 to Sentinel-2. Here, we're comparing Sentinel-2 to Sentinel-2. So we're using the same after image and a new before image. And this means that we'll be able to compare the detection maps from the ideal same sensor case to the uh, multi-sensor case. And that gives us these two detection maps with the, uh, the multi-sensor detection map on the left and the same sensor map on the right. And from there, we can do a normalized difference of the two in this case, the red pixels correspond to a higher SAR to MSI change, um, and blue corresponds, corresponds to a higher MSI to MSI change detection score, and white indicates agreement between the two. So we do see agreement in general over the stadium construction. There are some areas where there are differences, uh, which isn't surprising because the two modalities are, are sensitive to different types of changes. So that is surface versus material. But we are seeing um, generally good agreement, which, which is exciting to see. OK, so let's go back to the change detection maps. Uh, and if we look again at the area over the stadium, we can see an L-shaped building that we've highlighted in red uh, that is more anomalous in the detection map on the right in the multispectral to multispectral change detection result. And so we were curious about this and started looking into it. Um, one of our teammates, Chris, did some investigation. So he looked it up, um, saw that it was a UPS office. He called them um, and asked if they'd done anything to their roof the last few years and, and didn't get very far. And then he sent us this email. So uh, we were a little bit stuck on, um, on what might have caused this change, but we did some more digging um, and wanted to try and figure out what was happening there. So this is a Google Maps image. It shows the building, um, it's present prior to when the construction of the stadium began. So, it's began. so it's not a new building, it was already there. Uh, we did notice that the roof was an orange beige color that was kind of similar to the dirt in the surrounding stadium. Um, we pulled images from news articles as well, and we found this one where they're covering the construction of the stadium. And you can see in this case, uh, the roof is white in 2018. So a few years later, it's white. Uh, so we've got a case where the roof changed during the um, before and after images that we were analyzing. So in this case, uh, the multispectral to multispectral change detection picks this out because of the material change. So it is sensitive to that. But SAR to multispectral does not pick this out, uh, which is not surprising. It's not a strong surface change, right? It, it's still a rooftop. Um, we then dug into the Google Earth historical layers for this location, and we could see the replacement of the roof over the course of a year. Um, so from 2016 to 2017, uh, we had the, the roof changing in there. Okay, so that wraps up our initial SAR to MSI experiments. Uh, for our second set of experiments, that's where we focused on multispectral to multispectral, but from different sensors. Uh, so again, we considered Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8. Uh, from July 7, 2017 to January 2019, we pulled all Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 images that were cloud-free over the footprint of the stadium. And we focused in on the construction site. So it's a smaller footprint than in the, the last experiment, uh, but we wanted to do uh, more, more focused analysis. And here we separated the region into nine subtiles so that we could look at summary statistics uh, over time for, for these individual tiles. Okay, so we ended up with this. Uh, in, this, uh, in this plot, each line corresponds to a subtile, so there are nine in total, and each point corresponds to a Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 pair or vice versa. So what we're showing is the maximum 
multispectral anomalous change detection score in each tile plotted over time. Uh, these are exploratory results because we didn't have really robust ground truth. Uh, so once we got this, we wanted to dig into uh, those higher detection scores a bit more. So we focused in on some high scoring changes. Um, let's see. So we've got A and B, and I'll, I'll show you what images corresponded to those. Okay, so for anomalous change A, uh, this corresponds to a Sentinel-2 and then lane set 8 pair taken about a week and a half apart. And we can see in the detection map on the right, there's a strong detection score in that upper left um, uh, tile of the image. Okay, so... We're trying to figure out what it was. Um, it looks like that some kind of caravans or trucks potentially parked at the forum. Uh, the forum is an arena right by the stadium. It's that round white uh, building in the upper left corner. It shows up brighter in the detection maps, you can see, because it's a persistent anomaly within the two images. Um, it looks like the anomalous change might correspond to some temporary parking there. So we then looked into events at the forum around the second set of dates. Uh, and we found that it had hosted the MTB VMAs just the day before the second image was taken. So that uh, potentially accounts for the trucks or caravans that are parked next to the building. And our method was sensitive to this kind of fleeting change. Okay, so next let's look at anomalous change B. Uh, so here we've got a Landsat 8 and then Sentinel-2 pair, and we can see that the anomalous change is something that appears in the second image. Okay, so the key here is that uh, the images were taken only 12 minutes apart. Uh, the streaky change in the second image, it corresponds to a red, green, blue pattern. You can kind of see in the zoomed in area. And that is something that is characteristic of an airplane flying through the scene. It, it has this pattern because there's a slight offset in timing uh, in Sentinel-2's band collection. So I think it's on the order of microseconds. But when you have something moving really fast through the scene, it's going to um, it's going to light up in those different channels at slightly different points in time. So we were excited about this result in particular because even with a very complicated urban background, the method is able to suppress uh, these potential background changes and the background clutter and key in on this more salient change. Okay, so next, you might be wondering, um, did we do any quantitative analysis, right? Um, so the answer is yes. So, so far we've shown qualitative results and this is admittedly a, a tricky research area because there aren't many purpose-built ground truth data sets for multi-sensor change detection. So I'm, you might be wondering how we did the quantitative analysis. Um, I won't get into the details of the quantitative work here, but for that effort, um, we did a number of experiments where we implanted known changes into the images and computed the associated rock curves. So by implanting these changes, we were able to get good statistics and also compare detection performance across different classes of changes. Um, so it's something like going from vegetation to urban. Uh, we did this for a combination of experimental types. We did same sensor, we did multi-sensor with the same modality, um, and we also did multi-sensor multi-modality, SAR to MSI. So the eye chart on the right is just meant to give you a quick flavor of these experiments, but we've got all the details in a JARS publication that I'll, I'll reference again at the end. Okay, so going back to the experiments, we've covered uh, frameworks one and two. Now we're gonna talk about the third framework, uh, which is feature augmentation. So we were really excited about the results in the first two sets of experiments, and we started to think about how we could then improve the detection performance. So uh, much of this next research uh, focus, it was published in an SPIE 
proceeding that I'm showing at the top, um, but it unfortunately suffered uh, from a healthy dose of LGOP, um, which is a quote from two of my favorite colleagues, uh, James Filer, quoting James, or quoting Dave Messenger, um, and that stands for looked good on paper. Uh, so <laughs> this was something where the, the idea felt good, um, but the implementation details were, were quite a bit more challenging. So next, I'll walk through how we approached feature augmentation, what worked, and talk about where we faced challenges. Okay, and I do wanna say, I still think it's a good idea and worth exploring. Uh, there are so many permutations for how to explore it that it can be hard to identify boundary conditions for the research. So I'll show you what we did uh, and ideas for where to take it, and I hope that you might have ideas as well. Okay, so what is the idea? Uh, in So if we take a step back in the change detection approach, we're using this joint distribution metric. Um, we're comparing uh, pairs of pixels to other pairs of pixels, and it's based on some type of mutual information. Um, and so we, we recognized that we were not considering spatial information, and that if we uh, augmented the images with feature layers, that we might be able to capture some of those, some of the local neighborhood information at the individual pixel level. And by doing that, uh, we thought that we might be able to increase the kind of background non-anomalous change mutual information between the two images, and that would lead to better change discrimination. So the algorithm that we're using lends itself really well to this type of approach because it has that flexibility uh, for, in the number of channels that the images have. So we asked ourselves, uh, if we have augmented feature layers, can we have higher mutual information between image pairs? And can that be a predictor of better change discrimination? Uh, and there's a question, do we do this to one image? Do we do this to both? What are the trade-offs? So we focus on same sensor spectral imagery to start with the intent to expand it to multi-sensor imagery. So uh, for this study, we didn't use the previous images I was talking about. Uh, we instead used data from the Via Reggio 2013 trial set. It was an airborne hyperspectral trial with 511 channels. Uh, but to, to scope this study, we used an eight channel subset for these experiments. Uh, the, the trial that Via Reggio did is really well ground truth. So there are a lot of intentional um, experimental ground changes making it good for this type of more quantitative analysis. Uh, we also labeled uh, our own changes. So we captured um, background changes like cars moving, and, and you can see those here. So in the RGB composite on the right, the cyan changes with the magenta guard windows are the experimental changes, and the yellow uh, background changes with the green guard windows are uh, the ones that we labeled, but we considered all of them when doing this analysis. The reason we did this is we didn't want to penalize our approach um, for detecting some of those background anomalous changes, and we also didn't want to give it credit um, if it missed them and, and, and should have detected them, but we weren't including them in our, our truth mask. Okay, so this was the data that we used for our analysis uh, for our first experiment. We derived statistical and physics-based feature layers for just one image, um, and we did it for each image. Then we computed the mutual information between the first image and then the augmented second image. We looked to see if the mutual information improved, and then we looked to see if higher mutual information led to better detections. Uh, okay, so the spoiler alert is that it didn't really, at least not by much, and, and we're not entirely sure why that's the case, um, but we did quite a few um, it, it experiments to arrive at that. Uh, and for the second experiment, we derived the feature layers for both images, and we computed mutual information between the two augmented images, looked to see if mutual information improved, and looked to see if higher mutual information led to better detections. Uh, and the spoiler alert, spoiler alert here is that it did in some cases. 
Okay, so to give you a quick flavor of the um, the features that we explored, I won't get too into the weeds, but I want to go through these slides quickly. The first one that we looked at was local binary patterns. It's a classic computer vision texture. It's easy to compute, um, and it results in one feature channel per image channel. So if you think about our eight channel image, um, that would result in eight additional feature layers. So LVP only computes per channel. So you kind of get a, um, a multiplication there that can happen pretty quickly. Uh, another computer vision standard is the Herlick feature set. So for these, the gray level co-occurrence matrix is used to calculate a set of statistical descriptor features. Uh, we use the first nine features, which also each produce a feature map per image channel. So if you have eight uh, bands and you're computing nine features per channel, again, you've got eight times nine um, augmented layers potentially. And so that can expand quite quickly. And each of these features has their own parameters that you can tweak. We also implemented a feature type that was based on the fast Fourier transform. So we called this a spectrogram feature. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Here we were just re-representing each pixel as the coefficients from an FFT. Uh, so for these test images, the resulting feature spaces had five channels per image. That was what we uh, that was what we chose. So that's nice because each image. Um, can be captured all at once in the, in the feature layers. And then the last type of feature that we implemented was an in-house derived uh, texture. So we called it a neighbor spectral feature space. And the idea was uh, that we wanted to have a way to capture if a center pixel's relationship to its neighbors was the same as its neighbors relations to their neighbors. So basically, um, do if I look different from all my neighbors and my neighbors don't look different from each other, then, then maybe I'm the more anomalous one. So it's another statistical descriptor of the neighborhood. Um, again, this intends to capture, does my relationship with my neighbors compare with my neighbor's relationship to their neighbors? Try and capture some of those local anomalies. Uh, so in uh, in a real world scenario, we we can't know for certain ahead of time which augmented channels will improve detection performance because we don't have ground truth, and that would that would defeat the purpose of doing change detection if if you already knew where the changes were. But if we focus on mutual information, we can potentially use that as a predictor of improved performance. And mutual information is something that we should be able to compute uh, a priori without knowledge of the scene content ahead of time. So our hypothesis, again, is that higher mutual information between the images will lead to better change discrimination. A challenge that we faced is that there is not a useful generalized mutual information uh, computation for multi-channel imagery. And so um, that is one of the open research areas here because it, the question that we contended with is how can we use mutual information to evaluate future utility if we're only able to compare channels at a time? Um, that becomes this huge combinatorial issue. So each image channel can generate hundreds of features. And then you're trying to do this combinatorics between images with hundreds of potentially augmented features to understand which ones are useful. So I'm gonna skip over a bunch of the work, which is in a publication that we have, but the, um, the challenge is really this combinatorial, um, this combinatorial nightmare uh, when it comes to trying to figure out how to pick the most useful feature maps. So uh, we tested so many combinations of channels and I'm gonna uh, skip through that uh, in the weeds part and, and show you what some of our takeaways were for this. I'm not necessarily advocating that the same thing that we did is what, what should be done, uh, but these are the results from augmenting channels to both images, because that's the case where we did see some improvement um, when we augmented some of those channels. So here, one of the things we did um, just to constrain the problem was we did the same types of channels for each image. So we didn't touch different types of augmented features for the two images. So 
parallel for image one and spectrogram for image two. We didn't do that. So just the same features were augmented. Um, we then looked at detection performance uh, via the area under the curve at three fixed false alarm rates. And you can see those here. So 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.25. Uh, what I want you to take away from here is that it is possible to improve performance by adding features. Um, it's also possible to have worse performance by adding features. Uh, so it's not surprising that adding the linear um, binary patterns uh, led to worse performance because there was low mutual information for all LBB pairs. So we do think mutual information is a good potential predictor for performance. How to calculate that mutual information is, I think, an open research area, or how to do it in a way that, that makes sense for this kind of problem. So this set of experiments, it, it answers some questions, but also opens up a number of new questions. Okay, so now the wrap up, that's it for the results I'm showing you today. Uh, so really going out with a bang uh, with, this, <laughs> with those last good performance results. But to wrap things up, um, as I mentioned, you know, we're not working on this currently. We have a number of publications uh, that offer more detailed explanations and potential paths forward. And we'd love to talk about directions that this could go. Um, if you are interested in learning more, the main publication uh, that I would recommend is looking at our, our JARS paper, the Journal of Applied Remote Sensing. Uh, it, it expands the previous SPIE paper, and it, it gives a more comprehensive overview of the multi-sensor work and the quantitative analysis that we did. And I, I would also recommend looking at our 2023 SPIE proceeding, where we talk more about that feature augmentation study. Uh, now, lastly, most importantly, or, well, maybe not most importantly, but importantly, um, although our full code base has not been open sourced, uh, we do have the foundational same sensor anomalous change detection work that James Thyler spearheaded, uh, which uses the joint distributions uh, uh, we have the code available for that. That's been open sourced by Los Alamos, and that is available on GitHub. Okay, so uh, again, I hope that at least one of you is interested in picking this up and pushing on it more, uh, because I think there are a lot of really interesting research threads that could be pursued. Uh, so some of the takeaways are we can perform anomalous change detection across sensor designs and modalities and scale over time with opportunities for improvement. MSACD does not require resampling the images in signal space. Uh, the feature augmentation may be used to improve detection. Uh, and we've got a number of ideas for future work. And this is, you know, if, if folks are interested in collaborating, I'd be happy to talk about the, that and what that might look like. But I'm really feeling this as like pushing these ideas out of the nest. Whoever wants to take them and run with them can. Um, so some ideas are smarter spatial resampling, uh, potential further feature augmentation work, including across modalities, right? The results we showed were just the, um, the subset of the Via Reggio hyperspectral data better features. We just did some mostly off the shelf ones. Um, what would be really key is a straightforward method for mutual information between multi-band images. Um, and another area would be implementing multi-sensor ACD across all images for a particular location. So a, a broader number of sensors. Um, and with that, I would be happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you so much, Amanda. This, that was um, a very exciting talk. Um, we have one question already in Q&A. Do, do you want to look at that and answer? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this one's from Kamal. I'm curious to see how sensitive is the proposed method to seasonal changes. It rarely snows in LA, but in another place where the effect of seasons is more effective, will this approach be able to pick up salient changes in the scene? So that's a great question. And I, I do have to... Um, kind of reveal how conditioned I am to being in Los Alamos because I was like, oh, but it's snowing in Los Alamos right now. We refer to Los Alamos as LA um, because we live in a bubble. So you're right, it rarely snows in 
the real LA, Los Angeles, um, but it, it can potentially snow other places. So I, I don't have these results here, but we did, um, we did look at uh, more of these seasonal types of changes. So uh, drier vegetation to healthier vegetation. And we are able to pick up um, the, um, the salient changes in the scene. That said, it, we, um, for the, the quantitative analysis that I mentioned that's in the JARS paper, we did find that the ability to discriminate is much better for some of those um, more orthogonal kinds of class changes. Uh, when the anomalous change is a type of um, vegetation to a different type of vegetation, it's a lot harder to pick out than if it's vegetation to road or something like that. Um, so that's a that's a really good question, and I'd say it, it, um, that the the seasonal changes aren't as much of an issue as the actual anomalous the um, discrimination ability of the anomalous change that you're that you're caring about. So we've got another question: How to register the SAR and MSI images? That's a great question. Uh, we got really lucky because Descartes Labs did a lot of the. Um, the registration work on the back end. So thinking about two aspects of registration, there's there's aligning the images just so that they're that they've got the same footprint, and then there's the um, spatial resampling. That's a good question because I didn't I didn't get into details there. Uh, is that uh, is oh, yeah. that data set? Um, I know you mentioned I think the single sensor part is public public domain, but is the SAR to MSI public domain as well, or are there plans to make that public domain? That's a good question. So, um, so we, in working with Descartes, we didn't actually have any of the images locally. We were uh, helping them beta test a Python-based platform that I believe is still available, where all of the um, you could query the images and they were all served to you as Python arrays, which was really nice because uh, we didn't have to store all the images locally. We just were able to work on the Python arrays directly. So I know in our publication we um, we talk about which images we use. So in theory, one could go and pull those images themselves, but I think there would be a little bit of work on the back end to do that kind of alignment. I believe Descartes still has their uh, access to their platform available, especially for um, academic research. I think it's free to access. I don't quote me on that because I, I could be wrong, but but that was a huge help for us um, in, in doing that streamlined access. And they did um all of the like the kind of geospatial registration on the back end too so um putting everything in sort of the common grid they didn't do the um the resampling of the spatial resolution that was something that we did uh, but they did the the primary registration so short answer is i don't know that's a good question all right there are more questions coming in yeah uh so, so for resampling the images, what we did um, was just a, a straight nearest neighbor resampling. So, uh, for the Sentinel One images, I think the SAR pixels were ten meters, um, and for Sentinel Two, it ranges from ten to sixty meters. So, we just did a nearest neighbor resampling for all of it to ten meters, um, and. Uh, and we made use of a uh, a feature in the anomalous change detection approach with the joint distributions that has some um, ability to deal with slight misregistrations called local co-registration adjustment. And so that um, helps deal with potential slight offsets between the images from the, the different sensors. Uh, and then for the, for the Sentinel-2 to Landsat-8, we did all of that at a 10 meter resolution. So we would take a 30 meter by 30 meter Landsat pixel and just split it into nine equivalent 10 meter pixels and line those up. But that was just a quick and dirty way that, you know, we could sleep um, about at night. So any other um, any other ideas there are, are totally welcome. Um, so the next question is, have you applied this method to natural disaster change detection, like hurricanes or earthquakes? 
That's a great question. I, I don't have it here. We did look at landslides um, at one point, but not with not with any rigor. And so I think that would be an opportunity for, for something like this. Um, another natural disaster that we, we had thought about, um, but had trouble getting good imagery for is sinkholes. Uh, that's a really interesting change because it's very sudden, right? You've got um, a lot of background changes in the surrounding area and then just a significant change at the area of interest. So I think that would be a good, um, potential application area if somebody's interested. Um, okay, so the next question is in using SAR images, is it also considered the coherence as additional layer? That is a great question. So we are only using the intensity with the SAR image examples we showed here. And I think that is one of the opportunities for pushing on this more, capturing uh, the co coherence, making use of that phase information. Uh, I know that there are some um, classification methods for, for SAR based on um, the polarimetry of the scattering and, and you could potentially you could potentially augment the images with even like a classification layer based on um, some of that information. So it'd be a way to incorporate incorporate it in. Uh, but we we focus strictly on the intensity here. So that's a great question. Okay, uh, the next question is uh, regarding additional features. Uh, so when I think neighbor relationships, I think convolutions. Have you considered something like an off the shelf remote sensing oriented CNN for feature extraction? Um, a lot of them exist that would work with MSI data. You could borrow the first set of kernels without having to fine tune. So that is a great idea. Uh, the only reason that we, we didn't use something like that was just computational power. Um, so we were trying to do some more lightweight uh, things to, to demonstrate out the proof of concept and quickly realized that our, our biggest issue is going to be the um, combinatorics side of things. So I think that's a great idea and it would be a, a super interesting way to, um, to add on some additional features that don't necessarily make these statistical assumptions that aren't quite right for spectral data. So that, that's a great suggestion, Ryan. Um, okay, so the next question, uh, is it possible to apply this method to SAR images from different frequencies? I wonder if SAR images from different radars should be treated as multi-sensor data or not. Ooh, that's a good question. So I am, I am more of a spectral person than a SAR person. Uh, that's a good question. And I'm, um, I, I have a colleague that has been applying this approach to um, two pairs of SAR images, and I, I don't know if she's done it for ones from different frequencies, but I, I would think that the same uh, the same principles would apply. You, you can turn the crank on it, right? The math works, um, and so you um, it might allow you to do that kind of comparison. Um, where even though you're measuring something fundamentally slightly different, right, at the different frequencies, you can look at the distributions of the data. So I have not thought about it. That's not something we looked at, but I think that's a really interesting idea. Let's say add it to the list of uh, future research opportunities. That's a cool, that's a good question. All right. That's uh, good. Uh, I think there's a couple of comments in chat. I'd okay. like to, uh, Emmett uh, mentioned about uh, an IRPA program called SMART. Uh, started a couple of years ago with the goal of harmonizing multispectral, multi-sensor, space-based uh, imagery, as well as algorithm development for natural and man-made change detection. And he was, his comment is, didn't know if your work was similar to activities there uh, in the event you knew about their activities. So that's a great question, Emmett. Um, we were actually asked to provide feedback on that program um, when Tori was first spinning it out. And I will say they got the idea for the LA Rams stadium from us. Um, so I know that was one of the, um, the addition or the initial focus areas. Um, this work partly preceded that effort. Um, and then I think went in slightly different directions. So I am aware of it. And I, I think there are some um, common uh, 
areas of interest there. I, I, I think in the work that I've seen from them, most of that focus has been on finding those domain transformations that put the images in the same kind of common domain. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a different perspective than this, but I, I think you're right, it is going after that, that same kind of problem. But we should we should talk more about that. And then John Karakis uh, mentioned, well, he's inviting us all to participate in a planned feature experiment for September 2025 to deploy well ground truth experiments for multi sensor collections. Uh, change detection would be a great experiment. So there's a link for everyone if you're interested. I personally would be, and uh, maybe I, John, I could also reach out to IADF and see if we could have broader engagement on that. If, if you think that could help. I will say I yeah, we've talked at Los Alamos about it. And so John, I'm I'm gonna follow up with you guys, but but we're we're gonna find a way to participate. I think that sounds awesome. Sounds good. All right, this was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, uh, for the wonderful talk. I, I I've gotten plenty of ideas, I think, on, on things we could potentially work on. So I'll be reaching out to you. Awesome. Uh, that sounds great. All right, uh, and uh, with that, uh, we conclude our webinar. And I, I thank everyone for uh, participating and thank the speaker for making time to be with us today and sharing the work. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, so much. Take care.